Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Today, physicist Wal Thornhill concludes his three-part presentation on the early science results from NASA's Juno mission to the gas giant Jupiter. As previously noted, like countless other recent space discoveries, the mission findings are challenging not only long-held assumptions about Jupiter, but also consensus theories of planet and star formation and the history of our solar system. On the question of Jupiter's internal structure and composition, Thornhill offered the provocative thesis that Jupiter is hollow. In this episode, Thornhill presents his predictions for forthcoming Juno revelations, including the mystery of what lies beneath the planet's great red spot. We begin with some further explanation of electrogravity. Of course, the idea of a hollow Earth with an inner surface like a geode is a formidable challenge to our entrenched belief that the Earth has a dense core. It's a belief that can only be overcome by explanation, by demonstration, and by a willingness to consider the evidence. Consider for a moment that the electrogravity model presented here applies equally to any spinning object, where the heavy nuclei in each atom are offset radially from the spin axis to form tiny radial electric dipoles. This is the simple reason why inertial mass is equivalent to gravitational mass. The centrifugal force is not a fictitious or pseudo-force, it's identical to gravity. It's the reason why a spinning space station like the one famously modelled in Stanley Kubrick's landmark film A Space Odyssey produces its own gravity. This raises the question how someone in the space station knows they are spinning, only by looking out of a window and seeing the stars sweep past. The so-called fixed stars are the reference standard for all motion in the electric universe because the electric force of gravity connects all matter in the universe, practically in real time. That's why gyros are used for inertial navigation, because they tend to lock themselves gravitationally to the matter in the rest of the universe. Think about it. In a universe of countless negatively polarised stars and planets repelling each other, A gyro has a positively polarised rim, which is attracted to all of those celestial bodies. Sadly, those who have demonstrated what seem to be anti-gravity effects of gyros have not had any useful understanding of gravity from physicists to explain what they were observing. Most significant was Professor Eric Laithwaite's 1974-75 Royal Institution's Christmas Lecture, finally posted online in December 2013, which I recommend watching. As for willingness to consider eyewitness evidence, scientists at the Royal Institution behaved predictably by refusing to broadcast the remarkable lecture on the grounds, as the Royal Institution website says, and I quote, Laithwaite appears to have used various engineering approximations in his calculations on the behaviour of gyroscopes, and when told by professional mathematicians that once the calculations were done rigorously, there was no discrepancy, he refused to believe them. These are the same professional mathematicians who can't define mass or energy in terms of matter, and have no sensible model of the real nature of gravity. Laithwaite was only one of three people since 1945 to deliver more than one series of the Royal Institution's Christmas lectures. His first series was the first to be televised on the new BBC2 channel. Back to Jupiter's origin and composition. Decades ago, the plasma cosmologist and Nobel Prize winning plasma physicist Hans Alfain predicted that stars would be formed along Birkel and current filaments inside molecular clouds. He famously said, gravitational systems are the ashes of former electrical systems. Infrared space telescopes have recently confirmed this, but no acknowledgement has been forthcoming from settled astrophysics because of their taboo against electricity in space. The electric universe simply adds that both stars and planets are formed in the same event. The cosmic lightning characteristically snakes about and is observed to toss the newly formed bodies out laterally, but collisions are avoided by repulsive gravity. The thousands of crazy exoplanetary systems are simply explained by the inward gravitational pressure of all other bodies in the universe against the repulsive gravitational force of the nearest dominant body. 
Hot Jupiters orbiting their star closely is not a puzzle when we get rid of the gravitational accretion and merger by collision myth. On the question of the composition of Jupiter, plasma physicists have shown that Birkeland currents draw the heavy elements towards the centres of celestial bodies and the gases form their atmospheres with hydrogen and helium outermost. So the composition of Jupiter can't be assessed from its atmosphere. Jupiter is not mostly hydrogen and helium. All of the issues raised mean Jupiter is a solid shell composed of heavy elements. It will have structure both on its external and internal surfaces. Jupiter is not, as Scott said of the simplistic standard model, boring and uniform inside. Anywhere you look will not look the same. So let's return to NASA's teleconference. Scott Bolton, Juno principal investigator, said, There are motions deep inside Jupiter that people hadn't anticipated, and the gravity field is consistent with that. What we were really looking for was a core, whether there was a compact core or no core, and instead what we found was that it looks really fuzzy. There may be a core there, and it may be very big, and it may be partially dissolved. That came as a big surprise to us, that there was no core. These mysteries extended to our magnetic field experiment. Jack Connany, Juno Deputy Principal Investigator, said, On Earth the compass doesn't deviate much from the north-south direction. On Jupiter the magnetic field was both stronger than we expected, where we expected it to be strong, and it was weaker than we expected, where we expected it to be weak. There are small spatial variations which indicate we may be very close to the source, so it may be above the metallic hydrogen and may operate in the molecular hydrogen envelope. The electrogravity model of hollow celestial objects removes any idea of planetary magnetic fields being generated by internal dynamos. That hypothesis has never been able to successfully model the complexity and variety of planetary magnetic fields found in the solar system. It doesn't work for the Sun, either. As Faraday found, magnetic fields are intimately associated with electric currents, but electrogravity is also associated with magnetism. Both forces have the same origin in the distortion of protons and electrons. The Earth shows a connection between the two forces, which requires a fundamental reinterpretation. The simplest explanation for a dipole magnetic field aligned roughly with the axis of rotation of a planet is that the planet carries a surface charge which constitutes a current. This was considered for the origin of the Earth's field, but it was rejected because the electric current of 10 to the 9 amperes required seemed too high because the charge it implied would generate a tremendously strong electric field at the Earth's surface, which doesn't exist. However, there is a clear air electric field of about 100 volts per metre. The problem with this argument is that to measure voltage requires a reference, and the Earth, or ground, is considered our reference voltage and it is clear that the Earth has plenty of electrons to carry the return current of our power networks. But the fundamental error comes from the belief that stars and planets can be considered electrically neutral in space plasma. This has been proven incorrect in the case of the Sun, where numerous electrical double layers or plasma sheaths have been found in the interplanetary plasma that reduce the electric field between them. The Earth has plasma sheaths in the ionosphere and magnetosphere which do the same thing, so the 100 volts per metre measured in the lower atmosphere doesn't give a true picture of the charge on the Earth. Venus's lack of a magnetic field could be down to its ultra-slow rotation, but it leaves Uranus and Neptune's oddly offset magnetic fields unanswered. It seems more probable that the cool solid shells of planets retain some of their nascent magnetic fields when the ambient field of their birthing Birkeland current was at its peak. Planetary rotation can also be understood as an imprint of the rotating Birkeland current filament. The slow retrograde rotation of Venus, its heat and lack of a magnetic field, argues for a different, recent birth. The global myths of Venus as the archetypal comet match this idea and introduce an alternative birth process for smaller rocky planets and moons by a process of electrogravitic expulsion from a much larger body, this proposal makes sense of the large numbers of satellites of the gas giants and the spectacular icy rings of Saturn, which are of very recent origin. Finally, a word about Jupiter's great red spot. Its continued presence for centuries is another argument for a solid body beneath the clouds. Its giant tornadic form is that of a continuous electrical discharge vortex 
from an elevated surface feature acting like a lightning rod, which could be the birth scar of one of Jupiter's moons. The Juno spacecraft is due to observe the Great Red Spot closely on its next close encounter with Jupiter, where I expect even greater gravitational and electromagnetic anomalies to be found associated with the spot. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.